Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're coming in for the video of today, and that is going to deal here today with the surrender at Apatomatox Courthouse, which was basically the surrender of General Robert E. Lee to the Union Armies of the United States under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant on April 9th of 1865, which kind of brought the Civil War to a close. Now, we will have two announcements to make at the end of this video, but let's get, I guess, right straight into this immediately. Again, we are going through the notebook. I think we're just going to call this the history notebook, the history encyclopedia, whatever you want to call it. We'll just call it that from now on. I don't care. Basically, as we kind of discussed last week, uh, the Confederates had abandoned their capital at Richmond. Lee had... had lost his defense at Petersburg, kind of told the Confederate government, Richmond, you need to evacuate. I can't hold it no more. I'm having to retreat. Well, while the Confederate government is now fleeing south, as we had mentioned, Lee and his army are now fleeing west. They're fleeing west of Richmond. They're trying to scound mostly for food and supplies because now with the Confederate government falling in Richmond, they really have no source of food or rations or supplies for their army. And the Army of Northern Virginia is kind of discouraging for the countryside. And at the same time, they are running because the federal government's troops, the federal troops under Grant, they're still pursuing them. They're still chasing the Confederates that are fleeing under Lee's command, which was the Army of Northern Virginia. And this was under Lincoln's order to keep – and uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who kind of ordered Grant to continue the pursuit until Lee gives up. We're this close, it's going to happen here real soon, and they kind of realize that very quickly. Now, at this time, Lee's army was not what it once was. He only had about 55,000 men under his command, and every day there were men that were deserting the army because they started feeling a sense of hopelessness. We're not going to get out of this this time. And remember, Lee had fought in this war. He took command in 1862, really, of the Confederate armies in the field, and he maintained this command ever since. Because of the fact that he was very good at fighting with a lower number of troops and managing to come out around with a victory or a retreat out of the most difficult of circumstances. And just this this one time, it didn't seem like his luck was going to run this time. It just wasn't going to work. And Lee himself kind of realized this. Lee decided, under pressure from Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who is also in flight now, he's heading south with the Confederate government, that his best chance at trying to survive with the Army of Northern Virginia was to head south and link up in North Carolina with the Army of Tennessee under the command of Confederate General Joseph Johnston. So this was his plan that, okay, we're kind of on the back ropes here. Maybe if me and Johnston can join up in our armies, we can merge together and we'll have a sizable opposable force to the Federals under Grant who are now pursuing us. So this kind of became his effort, a plan to try to break south in retreat there to North Carolina to join up with him. And at the same time, Johnston is trying to head north, but he's also being pursued because he's being pursued upward from South Carolina by Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, who had, as famously as we kind of may, might know, he's the one that did the big burning through Georgia all the way to Atlanta when he took it and destroyed a lot of country in Georgia, and which he was highly resentful, resented towards in the South. A lot of Southerners did not like this guy, and he's also the one that kind of quoted the term that war is hell. And he was Grant's best buddy, so of course they're kind of working together as well. Unfortunately for Lee, he did not get far after he decided to head south, because as they started heading south, the federal kind of start catching up, and Grant sends a Union Cavalry Regiment under General Philip Sheridan, ahead of Lee, and he actually gets ahead of him at Sires Creek and manages to capture 7,700 men, which is 7,700, whatever you want to say that. He manages to capture that. Lee can no longer, his cutoff across the creek's now go gone. He's got to find another way south if he can real quick because the Federals are coming at him, and this is coming near Apotomatux, Virginia by this point. On April 8th, Lee and his army basically, by this point, as they kind of assess the situation, the Union Army, Grant has finally caught up to them. They're basically surrounded. There is almost little chance that Lee and his army are going to break out. And under Lee's, with Lee's permission, on the next day, on April 9th, Confederate troops under Major General, Confederate General 
John B. Gordon try to make a breakthrough attempt, but unfortunately Grant kind of realizes what the Confederates are up to, and he sends two Union troop regiments to block off that route and cut them off, and it, it successfully works, and Gordon doesn't even really, after maybe a couple of minutes of trying to break through the line, he kind of realizes this ain't going to work, he falls back. By this point, the, the Army of Northern Virginia is basically, it's surrounded, it's done. There is no, there's no way that the troops are going to be able to get out, and if they're going to get out, they're going to have to fight their way out, and they're really in no condition to because they're lacking on supplies. The men are actually starving because there's no food, there's no rations, they haven't had nothing. And Lee kind of realizes this, and after Lee gets the word that Gordon's attempt has failed, and this is in his own words, he kind of makes this... He makes a, and he also realizes the fact now his army has now dwindled even further. He's lost seven, 7,700 men the day before. There's been hundreds of deserters, and where he had 55,000 roughly maybe a couple days before, now he's down to 28,000 of men. He's really dwindling on his numbers here, and Grant has over 60,000 in his command. Kind of a very bad superiority for Grant. I don't even know how, not Grant, but Lee. I don't even remember exactly how many men Grant had, but I know it's at least over 60,000. It could be over 80,000. I'd have to look at that again, or if you want to look it up on your own, that's fine with me. I don't really care. But the point I'm trying to drive is Lee's men, are they're dwindling very sharply, and they're vastly outnumbered by the federal forces that are now got them encircled. And Lee kind of realizes he has no choice. To kind of go, but to go talk to Grant and ask for surrender terms, he kind of comes to the final realization: I'm trapped. There's no other way out of this but surrender. And this is in Lee's own words. This was his quote that he told his uh, commanding officers on that day. He, Lee was quoted as saying, "There is nothing left for me to do but to but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths." He, although Lee knew knew surrender was the only option, he still did not really want to do it, but he kind of realized it's for the betterment and it's the best option I got. I got nothing else. So Lee then sends Grant a message, and he announces his willingness to surrender his Army of Northern Virginia to the Union or the United States, the North, whatever you want to call it. And Grant accepts this message, and he... I'll then allow, tell, sends a message back to Lee and tells Lee that he will allow Lee to choose where they should meet for to discuss the surrender terms. And Lee chooses here, he chooses the home of Wilmer McLean. At his, he has a home in, a, in the village of Apotomatux Courthouse in Apotomatux County in Virginia. And William, Wilmer McLean kind of has a weird story here. He's kind of a very odd, uh, coincidental thing where he lived. He, was, he is a retired Virginia militia officer at the time, and McLean had actually lived, four years earlier, he had lived at Manassas Junction in Virginia. And this was where the very first battle of the Civil War actually took place, at first Bull Run. And he actually had a cannonball go through his front porch. Well, after this battle, McLean and his family moved to a Potomac courthouse in an effort to try to get away from the war. And now they're going to meet at his house in, the, in, his, in his front parlor. To discuss surrender terms and McLean the rest of his life basically legitimately he did claim this and he legitimately could claim this that the war began in his front yard well the, no not yeah yeah no, no it goes like this the war began in his backyard because he was actually on his back porch and in Manassas the war began in, in my backyard and it ended in my front parlor <laughs> which legitimately he's not wrong so basically, they make this decision, let's meet at this home here, we'll meet there at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon today. So that brings us to the surrender here. Uh, this was still on April 9th, this is 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Lee and Grant meet at that time. They come in there, do excuse the phone. I don't exactly know why it's ringing here, let me see for a minute. I do pardon for that interruption, <laughs> but anyway, um, they meet here. They kind of exchange greetings as they come into the parlor, and Grant has got on his best uniform. He's got the sword and sash on. He looks like a fully dressed, 
U.S. Army general in Lee, he's wearing his mud-spattered field uniform. He doesn't really change for the occasion, which is understandable. Lee was never really, to my knowledge, he wasn't exactly a man of fine tastes every time. He was more content to wear whatever he had. He wasn't going to get fancy if he, did, if he felt he didn't have to. And upon Lee's request, they kind of have a little bit of small talk at first. And Grant kind of brings up the fact that they had both served in the Mexican-American War and that he had actually met him briefly. Now, Lee had actually had a higher rank. He was a general in that war, I think, or at least a major general. And Grant had been a quartermaster and they had met briefly, but Lee did not recall the meeting at all. But that was years. That was like over 20 years ago. It's understandable. And Lee basically is the one that actually has to get the faint ball rolling here, and he tells Grant, asks Grant for surrender terms, what they are. Grant tells him that, and then he asks Grant to write them down so they could formally come to an agreement on them. And Grant subsequently does this. He writes them down on a piece of paper in this parlor. And basically, here are the terms that Grant came up with that Lee agreed to eventually here at the end of this. The first term, they were actually pretty lenient because Grant was like, some Union commanders wanted to punish the South, and a lot of radical Republicans and politicians in Washington, they wanted to punish the South. They wanted unconditional surrender, and Grant was very well known for unconditional surrender himself, so for him to do this was impressive. But it largely, I think it came because he started to share a view with President Abraham Lincoln that when they end this war, they should do it quarterly, and they shouldn't do treat the South the Southerners, the rebels, as a defeated nation, they should treat them as fellow countrymen who are reuniting with us. Treat them as human beings. Treat them as Americans. Don't treat them as prisoners of war. Don't treat them as if it's an occupation. Just treat it as we're finally come, come back together. Let's work together. Let's do this peacefully. And it largely, it was very beneficial on Grant's part, and it really showed the part where Lincoln had put in his second inaugural address where he addressed malice towards none. He didn't want – Lincoln, in his view, he wanted a quick reconstruction, but he also wanted one that wasn't going to heavily pu punish the South for everything it had ever done. So in these terms, the first one that Grant writes is that all officers and men are were not – were to be pardoned. They will not be charged with treason. They will be placed on parole, but they will not be charged with treason against the United States. And they must hand over their arms. They will hand over the arms, but they will not be charged with treason. And they could be sent and they will be sent home and they can take their private property with them, including their horses, which was a big concern for a lot of these Confederate soldiers because it's now spring. It's that's planting season. They need and back then that we didn't have tractor, we didn't have mechanized tractors, we didn't have all this stuff. Horses are main, this, still the main source of planting and plowing. So they like, well, if you take our horses, because the customary was they would take the horses. Well, if they take your horses, how can we go home and plant crops? We can't do it. So Grant kind of obliged, and he said, they can take their horses home. We won't take that. We won't take no private property. Grant also puts that officers could, can keep their sidearms, their small pistols that they would have on their things or their swords, and that Lee's men were also to be given food, food, given food rations as they were starving, and Lee was very acceptable to this. He really loved that Grant did this. He, Grant told him, I would think about 25,000 food rations what might be enough. It was a little less than what, Grant, than what Lee had, but Lee was very thankful, and he said, yes, I think that would do immensely. That would be very well. After reading and going over the terms on the paper, Lee accepted them, and he signed them right then and there in that parlor, and then he left at 4 p.m. He got on his horse. His horse was named Traveler. It was a white horse, and he, as he began to got ready to ride off, Grant kind of tipped his hat, took his hat off, tipped it to him. Lee did the same thing in a court, court, courtesy gesture, and then Lee went back to his soldiers. When he arrived back at his camp, Lee, his, many of his soldiers kind of knew what was happening. Some of them were sad. They were depressed because they fought for four long years, and now they didn't think it was going to have ended like this. And Lee told them with kind of a little bit of sadness in his eyes and his heart, he kind of told them, I've done everything I can for you, boys. I've looked out for you. I've done everything I can. At the same time, back at the parlor, 
a lot of the Union soldiers, as they realize that Lee has surrendered, they start celebrating. They start playing music and band. And they get old livery, which is understandable. I mean, you fought four long years. This is basically the end of the war. Lee was the biggest and most important Confederate army left. And for most of, uh, throughout most of the war, it was the most important in general. And unfortunately for them, Grant didn't share that optimism, and he told them. It, following the malice toward non prospect, he kind of ordered it stopped. He said, we are not going to celebrate this at all. This is a somber moment. And that was really big on his part. And Grant then stated, after he kind of put an end to it, he stated, and this is in, in his own words, he's put that the war is over, the rebels are our countrymen again. Kind of splitting, don't be celebrating them as a conquered people. They're countrymen. They're Americans, just like us. Now, Grant did later go visit the Confederate camp later that day. He kind of, Him and Lee met with a lot of the Confederate officers just to greet them and everything else. And then they went, then Grant left and went back to his formal thing. And it was on the very next day that Lee's army formally came. They surrendered. They lined up and surrendered their arms to the Union lines. And as they were doing this, Grant and his subcommanders started, they ordered the troops to salute the Confederates as they did so. And this became really a very big gesture of kind of brotherhood toward the South. And they were, even the Southerners were amazed by this, and they saluted back. And Lee, because of this, he wouldn't allow no one the rest of his life, he would not allow you to come up in front of him and start trash talking about Grant because of how he had handled the surrender so well. Lee kind of viewed, no, this man was good when he did that. I will not have someone come in my house and insult that man after what he did. And even some of the Confederate generals like Longstreet and George Pickett kind of also said it was highly courteous and they were quite impressed and deeply heartfelt that they had ordered this. And then Lee, after they had done so, after they laid down the arms and slew to take place, Lee and his men dispersed. Lee gave a farewell address just before he left and then they all dispersed and went home. And that was basically it there. Now, that basically is the end of a pot of tux, but we'll discuss here what happened immediately, kind of here in, the, in about a month after. Upon hearing of Lee's surrender, a lot of the reigning Confederate armies, they kind of finally realized, well, if Lee surrendered, the gig is up, we're done. And they, a lot of them began, a lot of the, a lot of the remaining armies began to surrender to the Union forces. Joseph Johnston, who was still left out there in the field, he had the largest army, of course, that was left, the one that Lee had been trying to break south and join up with, and he surrendered in Dur Durham, Durham, North Carolina on April 26 to William Tecumseh Sherman, and he and Sherman followed Grant's lead, and he gave Johnston and his army relatively lenient terms as well. And then following this, a lot of the other generals, mostly in the Mississippi theater of the war, kind of began to surrender as well. General, Confederate generals Nathan Bedford Forrest, Edmund Kirby Smith, and uh, Richard Taylor also began to surrender. They did this in May. And on May 5th, 5th Confederate President Jefferson Davis, he meets with his cabinet as they're still fleeing south. They still think maybe they can escape and get out of the country. And they meet in Washington, Georgia, and they kind of form. That's the last time that Davis meets with his cabinet, and they formally dissolve the Confederate government once and for all. And Davis doesn't get far either because five days later, on May 10th, him and his wife, Verena, and their escort are finally captured by Federals near Irwinville, near Irwinville, Georgia, on May 10th. And it was actually purported that he was captured disguised as a woman, but that is a disputed fact. We don't know that for certain. Basically, the Civil War was basically done by this point. The Confederates were now widely surrendering. It was basically done. The last battle in any form was fought on May 12th to 13th. This was at Palmito Ranch in Texas. And ironically, this was actually a Confederate victory. But the Confederate army that had just won the surrender a day later, uh, Confederate general, to my knowledge, since the Indians and the Indian Territory kind of side with the Confederates because the United States government had broken a lot of their promises to the Indians, so they were kind of enticed, and especially the Cherokee Nation, which had slaves of its own. Uh, they had a Cherokee Mounted Rifle Infantry Division that they kind of had and Cavalry Division that they offered with the Confederates, and they were they did not surrender until Confederate Chief Stan Wat, Wati finally surrendered in June of 1865. And then there was a small, a small armored cruiser that got the word in 
about no about July and it was in the Pacific and it didn't get to England until November and they surrendered there in England and that marks the last Confederate surrender really and the war was officially declared over in uh, August 1866 with a Union victory but it was widely celebrated in May as everything was finally winding down basically people view viewed Lee's surrender as the main surrender and that concluded the war for them so that's basically what happened at the end of the Civil War with Apotomatux and everything else. That's basically the gist of all that. I will try to put a video either attached to this one or in the links page. I've been having some tr trouble trying to put it, attach it to the actual videos. It's been having a problem, but I will keep trying and see if I can get it to work. Uh, that concludes that one. Now, as for next week, I've already discussed kind of briefly in the discussion page on the channel what our to two topics are going to be. One is of very significant importance to me, and the I suppose they're both very important to history in general. On April 14th, we will do one on Abraham Lincoln's assassination, and I know some of you might get tired of the Civil War by now, but that will be the last one, I believe, on the Civil War era for a little while that we will do. But that will be the night that Lincoln got shot, which we've all probably learned since we first learned about Abraham Lincoln back in grade school. But We'll go into the details on that. And then on April 15th next week, we will be doing a major video. Could be one of our longer, could be the longest one I've ever done possibly because we will discuss the Titanic. And I don't just mean the sinking. We will try to incorporate the days before and maybe even the building of it if I can. And I basically had studied that topic since I was in second grade. So I'm like a certified almost expert on this. Un unofficial, but in a way, I'm like an expert on this. I could tell you about everything there is. So there will be a lot of material I will put in there. As I know, that's also a very famous history thing. Due, largely due to the 1997 blockbuster, big winning, money grossing movie. But the box office, but we'll try to stay off that leash as much as I can <laughs> because there's parts of that movie I have problems with but for the accuracy detail of how they portray the sinking actually happening is largely accurate so I do like it for that part but we'll discuss that next week so that will be the two videos for next week is the assassinate assassination of Abraham Lincoln on April 14th and on April 15th we will have the video on the Titanic disaster and then if anyone has any topics for the following week, be sure to let me know in the comments below or in the discussion page. Be sure to let me know that, and I'll be happy to look into them at starting the week after next. So we will definitely be able to do something then. Um, basically, that's all for this video. So if you like this or something like or anything of that, be sure to like, subscribe to the channel. Put a comment down below if you found any helpful hints or if you have any suggestions for a future video. Be sure to do that. So that's basically all for today. Hope you all stay well and healthy in the current coronavirus pandemic. Hope we all don't get it. So this is going to be me saying have a good, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you want to say. And have a good rest of your day and hope to see you all back here next week.